A tour of Villalobos and Chorus number three, Modernism, Nationalism, and Musical Anthropophagy. This paper will be divided into three parts and will last for about 22 to 23 minutes in total. In the 1920s, Brazilian composer Heitor Villa-Lobos wrote 14 nationalistic pieces called Choros, which were the direct result of his search for an authentic Brazilian musical language. In Choros, Villa-Lobos combined elements from the Brazilian urban popular genre Choro, from which he drew the title of his series, and Brazilian Amerindian music with European musical techniques, especially the imbalanced accents, abrupt metrical changes, and dissonances typical of Stravinsky's primitivism. With the exception of Choros No. 1, which is in fact a popular Choro, these compositions re reveal a hybrid style, blending European cosmopolitan musical techniques and aesthetics with characteristic elements of Brazilian local musical practices together. As Villa-Lobos affirmed in an interview to the New York Times in 1944, quote, I have always searched for a synthesis between Western culture and that of my own country, unquote. Chorus provide a good example of this philosophy. Through this series, Villa-Lobos in effect elevated a local tradition to the status of art music, developing a musical aesthetic that could be appreciated both locally and internationally. Choros was Villa-Lobos' attempt to musically portray the essence of Brazilian people. The so-called Brasilidade, or Brazilianness, or also Brazilian character. The search for Brasilidade in arts was the main tenet of Brazilian modernist artists of the 1920s and 1930s, with which Villa-Lobos was involved to some extent. Due to Brazilians' mixed ethnic heritage, which included European, African, and Amerindian, the definition of the Brazilian character had challenged intellectuals since at least the late 19th century, and modernists fully embraced and furthered the discussions and artistic manifestations on this pursuit. Modernists officially launched the Brazilian modernist movement through the Week of Modern Art of 1922, and from that point on they started to exercise a fundamental role on Brazilian arts. Their philosophies challenged the established modus operandi of Brazilian society, which was firmly rooted on European traditions. Poet Oswald Andrade wrote two manifestos that epitomized the essence of modernists' search for Brasilidade. The Manifesto Pau Brasil, or Manifesto of Brazil Poetry, sorry, of Brazil Wood Poetry, from 1924, and the more aggressive and provocative Manifesto Anthropophago, or Anthropophagic Manifesto, from 1928. In the first, Andrade suggested that, like the Brazil wood, the first Brazilian product to be exported to Europe, the authentic Brazilian elements of modernist poetry, couched in cosmopolitan techniques, would guarantee its exportation to Europe. On the Anthropophagic Manifesto, also called Cannibalistic Manifesto, Andrade extended this idea to Brazilian arts as a whole. More aggressively, this manifesto asserted that which the previous one had only suggested, that Brazilian artists should devour, assimilate European techniques and aesthetics to portray national art. Andrade did not elaborate this aesthetic of assimilation and synthesis, but theorized upon it and named named anthropophagic, an aesthetic that already existed in Brazil. Villa-Lobos was well acquainted with Oswald de Andrade's manifestos and the philosophies of Brazilian modernists, and even participated of the Week of Modern Art. Thus, his ongoing personal search for a synthesis of Brazilian local musical practices and European music received a major intellectual boost from modernists. While scholars Lisa Peppercorn Eero Tarasti and George Coley suggested that Villa-Lobos took advantage of a Paris thirsty for exotic music to elaborate the aesthetic of Chorus and other pieces from the 1920s. They failed to notice that the Chorus series resulted from Villa-Lobos' personal search for a Brazilian musical language that both contributed to and reflected the philosophies of an entire class of Brazilian artists. Given the importance of the series and the need to contextualize these works 
within broader artistic ideologies in Brazil. This paper illuminates how Brazilian modernists' philosophies of nationalism contributed to the crystallization of the aesthetic of Choros. This paper presents as a case study an analysis of Choros number no. 3 from 1925 that reveals the anthropophagic essence of this piece, in which Villa Lobos blended Brazilian Amerindian musical elements with techniques of European music. As I argue, the Choros series as a whole worked as a musical index of social and cultural dilemmas intrinsic to the formation of Brazilian people and, and in that sense, contributed to the intellectual search for Brasilidade. Regarding the beginning of the 1920s, when Vila Lobos started composing his Choros series, Mário de Andrade, no family relationship with Oswald de Andrade, one of the most important Brazilian modernists, known as the Pope of Modernism, felt that, Brazilian, that Vila Lobos finally faced, quote, the problem of Brazilian music, in which he had made rare incursions. This leads him to a much more frank and tonal harmonization in which the enhancement of dissonance acquires more harshness and expression. Villa Lobos adheres to modern anti-impressionistic music from which predominates in himself the lesson of Stravinsky's instrumental music." Unquote. These compositional elements mentioned by Andrade, along with Villa Lobos' borrowings from Brazilian folk, Amerindian and popular music, were essential for him to elaborate his own musical language in what Andrade called Villa Lobos' second compositional phase, which, according to the intellectual, happened only after the week of modern art of 1922. Choros exemplify Villa Lobos' nationalism and how he translated into music the impressions he had of the vast Brazilian land and all its diversity. In his words, quote, Choros represent a new form of musical composition in which the different modalities of Brazilian Indian and popular music are synthesized, having as most important elements the rhythm and any typical melody of popular character that show occasionally or by accident, always transformed according to the personality of the author. The harmonic procedures are, similarly, a complete stylization of the original." Unquote. Villalobos addressed Choros as a synthesis of Brazilian Indian and popular music, indeed giving himself a poetic license of sorts by invoking the personality of the author. Villalobos assumes the freedom to utilize any compositional technique that would fit this purpose. Table 1 provides information about Choros that shows some of their individual characteristics, permitting a better understanding of the variety found in this piece understood here by cataloging media and durations. This variety is reflected in the musical structure of each shoro as well. Although grouped as a series, they all have unique musical structures. As Villa Lobos said, quote, In shoros, I had no fixed formulas for the use of the themes. I used them for the development of atmosphere as I feel the need. I never repeat themes merely for the pleasure of repetition or to create cyclic music. I do not use ready-made folk songs and dance. My themes often suggest folk themes, because they have the same aspect of folk themes. In my music, there are no so-called influences. It is thoroughly American, of our continent, belonging to no school or special trend. I also do not know what the word inspiration means. I create music out of necessity, bi biological necessity. My artistic creed is la liberté absolue. When I write, it is according to the style of Villa Lobos." Unquote. Villa Lobos actually used ready-made melodies on his shoulders number 3 and number 10, for instance, but despite he may have exaggerated on the passion of his words to convey a sense of originality to shoulders, these words reveal his truly nationalistic pursuits and some of the local musical elements he used to convey brasilidade to his compositions. Regarding Villa Lobos' borrowings from Amerindian and popular music, which conveyed the national essence to Choros, Gerard Beag argued that, quote, one could venture the generalization that numbers 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, and partially 9 and 12 do exhibit some aspects, however stylized, of the popular Choro of the beginning of the century, while numbers 3, 6, 8, and 10 evoke, in part, Indian primitivistic music however idealized. In some, both evocations appear." Unquote. 
Despite the differences among Shoros, the pieces are founded on the same ideological conception. Villalobos freed himself of formalistic structures to elaborate music that reflected his country, and he found on modernists' nationalistic philosophies the intellectual support that he needed to pursue this undertaking and crystallize his musical aesthetics. We get to the end of part one, and now we move to part two.